Welcome to Dartmoor, a remote and vast area of moorland in the county of Devon in southwest Britain. Dartmoor National Park covers an area of 954 square kilometres, making it about the same size as 20,000 football pitches. It's famous for rugged landscapes, giant granite tours, windswept moors, Dartmoor ponies, picturesque villages, and is steeped in myths and legends. People have been living and working on Dartmoor for thousands of years and have shaped this ancient landscape over time. The moors are scattered with prehistoric hut circles and enigmatic stone circles and stone rows. In fact, Dartmoor is one of the most important archaeological landscapes in Britain. Hi, I'm Danny Wooten, Time Team's Finds Specialist and Community Archaeologist. I'm here on Dartmoor today to visit a 700-year-old farmhouse called Higher Uppercot, and I'm going to be finding out about an amazing collaborative project between yeah, Plymouth University yeah. academics and students and Dartmoor National Park. Using cutting-edge technology, they're going to be scanning Higher Uppercot and actually using that data and turning it into a game so that this remote farmhouse here on Dartmoor can be viewed all around the world, making it much more accessible for everyone to enjoy. What a fantastic project. Let's find out more about it. Throughout the year, in between the main dig episodes, we'll be dropping in on interesting projects like this one here in Devon. Now, you might be wondering what gaming or virtual reality have to do with archaeology. In fact, many parallels can be drawn between game development and the modern tools and techniques used by archaeologists. This might include collecting data, recording finds and features, mapping topography and reconstructing the past. Digital scanning is an increasingly useful tool to record archaeological features and to be able to virtually examine them remotely and without further disturbance. What's more, on Time Team, we're big supporters of the value of experimental archaeology. Experimental archaeology uses traditional tools and methods to recreate items such as clothing, metalwork, flint tools, or even processes such as cooking or building an Iron Age roundhouse to get a better understanding of their function and how they were originally made. And a similar process can also be applied to the virtual world. For example, attempting to accurately reconstruct a historic building might present challenges and questions that weren't necessarily apparent from the archaeology alone Oh guys, this all looks a bit technical. Can you tell me what's happening here? Yeah, so at the moment we're um, using a laser scanner to uh, project out and measure the space around us uh, so that we can then generate a 3D model uh, for that and put it into a game engine. Amazing. So Chris, can you explain a little bit about LiDAR? So basically the LiDAR scanner fires a load of lasers into the space wherever we've got it set up. It rotates around and as it you know, kind of fires the lasers off, it's measuring the time and distance that laser takes to hit a wall and come back to the device. That then gives us a very accurate reading of the space. We can take that data, put it into some digital authoring software and make a game environment based around the you know, kind of scan that we've given it. Fantastic. So you just used the phrase game environment. What does that mean? So a game environment is essentially where a game will take place. It's, you know, it has the narrative, it has all of the you know, kind of assets, all of the things that you would expect to see playing a game of a particular context. Um, so the environment you know, is, is where the game sort of takes place. So people, the game will happen, people will be able to sort of feel immersed in the game as if they're in the ship and here. Yeah, so they'll have the ability to walk around this space as a 3D environment so they can get up close to the walls, to the space and really understand what it's like currently and how it was before. So how are the students involved in this project? So with this project they're taking the research that was built on from the MA Heritage course at Plymouth University and they're using that research to then build an interactive narrative experience um, using this 
environment as the basis. Brilliant. Well, I think I've taken up enough of your time. It's really important that we get this all scanned today, isn't it? So I'm going to leave you to it. This is really exciting. So nice to chat to you. I'll see you in a bit. Cheers. James, what on earth are you doing? So at the moment, I'm scanning this building in order to make it much easier for us to put it into a video game type experience. OK, so what does this contraption do then? So what this does is scan the actual building pretty much down to the millimetre, saves us and, us and the students as well doing the hard work of kind of manually doing it, creating it in a 3D model or even just taking it from reference photos. By scanning this, what's that uh, going to look like in terms of the end result of the game? I mean, end result, hopefully, pretty much photorealistic. Wow. How is this game going to work? The person playing it will be able to explore kind of freely and kind of look right up to the whatever kind of catches their interest, but also learn about the importance of the building and the history of it as well. Wow. So can you tell us a bit about this equipment then? Yes, yeah, so um, this is a 3D scanner. There are many different types and thankfully they come down a lot in size. They are still hideously expensive. Um, so we're very fortunate to be able to hold it. That's why I'm kind of cradling this at the moment. It's <laughs> worth a lot. Um, but the good thing with this particular unit is it's got a screen in it as well, so it makes my job a lot easier. I haven't had that much training on it, but it doesn't take too long for you to kind of just pick up and get an idea to know what you're doing, but importantly, get the data that we need from it. And then what happens once you've got this data here? So then once we have that, we're able to put it into the computer and then put it into the video game engine that we're using and then kind of manipulate it where necessary. But hopefully if the data is good enough, the amount of work that will take will be a lot less than it would have been in the past. And this is all going to be done by the students yes. in your department, which is? So um, we're the IDAT department at the University of Plymouth. And so what's going to happen to the game? Is it going to be released? How are people going to be able to find out about it? So we're working with um, Dartmoor Park Authority. So I believe the aim is to try and get it into the hands of, of the public because really we want more people to know about what is here, both for those in the UK, those who live locally, maybe even internationally. I think that's a really fantastic way to get people involved, isn't it? Um, yeah. Particularly those who aren't able to visit this place for themselves. Exactly. I mean, that's the other thing with lockdown and COVID showing that we can't always travel as much as we want to. And again, the beauty of this is it means more people can see this, but also it helps to preserve this area as well. You don't necessarily want everyone trampling around <laughs> on it. So it helps it last even longer. Well, you've got an important job to do today, so I'll let you get on with it and I'm just going to watch you. Go on then. <laughs> you better crack on. <laughs> yeah, plenty to do. Oh, Martina, what are you doing? Uh, so I'm currently taking pictures of the with the witch marks that the people from Dartmoor believed in to protect them from like evil spirits and stuff. So I would love to like add this in into the game to like show off how superstitious they were with like little bits around the property. So yeah, this is a wonderful little detail, isn't it? This was caused by holding lit candles at 45 degree angle for quite a while. Um, and then you get this effect here, you can just, well, you can almost see the candle flame there, can't you, where it's burned in. And, and the idea was that, <laughs> bizarrely, that it was meant to protect against fire. Um, and actually, you can well imagine in a wooden timber frame building that you'd be very well aware that it might catch fire. So you would do everything that you could to ensure it was protected. So what a wonderful detail. OK, well, I shall let you get on with it. Thanks very much. Nice to chat. Yes. Well, that was brilliant, wasn't it? I just loved catching up with everyone, finding out about that project. It was wonderful to meet the students and the staff from Plymouth University to see how they're using this cutting edge technology and turning it into a game. I can't wait to play it. I hope you enjoyed that. We'll be following the progress of the project here at Higher Uppercot over the coming weeks, both on the Time Team official YouTube channel and on Patreon. You might recall the Time Team excavation at Tottyford on Dartmoor, our 200th episode, where we excavated a recently revealed stone circle amongst other prehistoric features.
And incidentally, we're not a million miles away, about 40 to be precise, from the Wolf Valley, now Roadford Reservoir, where the programme Time Signs was filmed, the precursor to Time Team, where Tim Taylor and archaeologists Mick Aston and Phil Hardin made their debut. Coming soon, I'll be taking a tour of Higher Uppercot with historic buildings expert and talented draftsman, Dr Richard Parker. You might remember Richard from our recent Cottage Core piece, and we look forward to sharing his unique insights with you. To ensure you catch all the latest updates, please do subscribe to this channel, follow us on social media, sign up to our newsletter and join us on Patreon.